It is March the 10th, 2023, and this is Curiously Polar. And he's back from the cold, from the south, from the Antarctic. Hi, Henry. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Good to have you back. Thank so, you. Glad to be back. Ah, Yeah, you've been on a ship Please. again. Yeah. How, how, how unexpected. <laughs> And uh, you've brought us uh, ice stories to talk about. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. The episode will be full of Antarctic stories. Just Which is a good fit. The... We are recording this early March. And yesterday we had snow here in Germany. So, yeah. <laughs> so hey, Antarctic conditions in Germany. It, not quite, but it's already, it's already, it's already gone again. So, um, But hey, hey. So it, I, I, I can relate. It's still the time of year where you can expect some... Some uh, solid precipitation every now and then, at least in our area here. That's great. That's good. Going somewhere. Yes. So, what did you bring us? Um, some news and then exactly. a bigger topic. Everything uh, related to ice. Yeah, kind of being the, the ice nerd. Um, so, I'm <laughs> sticking to the uh, frozen frozen liquid um polar newsreel starts with the first one which is life at the bottom of the southern ocean um the royal research ship uh, sir david Orten Edinburgh, which is just a little bit older than a year is down in antarctica the second season the second time last year was mainly a technical um ice trial if you like um seeing how the ship performs in ice conditions in antarctica and this year is more science trials. So they're down there with a full science schedule and just trying to deploy all the toys they have, all the gear, all the equipment, all the labs. And they brought a team down from the Falkland Islands uh, or from the UK through the Falkland Islands down to Antarctica. And they did um, an amazing research and they deployed quite a lot of um, technical stuff and gear and explore the the deepest area or one of the deepest areas around the antarctic peninsula which is close to the south orkneys and um, let me bring up a, a tweet here with some photos by the british antarctic survey exactly um, so if, if you're listening to it um hop over to youtube and uh, we just give you a little bit of visuals there as well or or follow along in the links that we put in the show notes um, absolutely there are some some photos here uh, here's a map of the Hesperides Deep. Exactly, and that is very close um, to the South Orkneys. It's between the South Orkneys and the South Shetlands. And it's going down there 5.6 kilometers um, into, the, uh, into the depth. And it's a deep sea basin, which is very little known or very little explored. So I've never heard of it. Me neither. Before, um, yeah, before actually getting up the news from the British Antarctic Survey, and it's among the deepest 6% of the Southern Ocean. So this particular part there, that tells you quite something, just given the scale of the of the whole area. And um, I'm following particularly two scientists who are on board. And one is Hugh Griffith, who is a marine biologist. And the other one is uh, Jamie Maxwell, who is a, a marine biologist uh, PhD, who is doing his PhD project on board, which I find quite a, an amazing um, chance to, to, to be on a research icebreaker like this um, being deployed to Antarctica and having the chance to actually do some field work um, on the seventh continent. So they deployed their research robots and, um, and trawling equipment and wanted to figure out what life at the bottom of those deep areas looks like and they retrieved quite some uh, amazing uh, creatures and they uh, got them back on board. Uh, they they photographed them, and now they are actually on their way back to to the UK um, to actually have a chance to research them in detail uh, in the laboratory. I give them names um, if they are unexplored before, if they are unknown, and now the exciting part starts. But just being able to actually deploy a 7.6 kilometer winch cable that <laughs> just goes down with uh, two camera systems, um, two types of different different trawlers and a CDD um, to, to measure uh, temperature, um, uh, salinity and so on. That's pretty, uh, yeah, a pretty amazing um, task. All in all, 
over the whole time they deployed over 100 kilometers of uh, of winch length um, into the wow. ocean which is really really amazing yeah do they have a backup winch just in case it gets it, it snaps or something the it's, cable snaps that's that's quite a long ways yeah. down there so there must be a lot of weight pulling on that uh, right at the top there yeah and uh, also considering the pressure uh, pressure down there so uh, i hope they have a, um, a replacement winch there um i don't really know i uh, haven't been on the uh, attenborough yet um so but it's just something to look up to so question to you, um, and I'm not sure if you're the right one to answer this, but um, th those those creatures are being pulled up from over five kilometers deep. They said here, they say that they, they de deployed yeah over 7.6 kilometers, so there's some slack, but it's over five kilometers deep. Um, and the pressure is amazingly strong down yes. there. It's an immense pressure. So when you bring these creatures up that are accustomed to that pressure, um, isn't that going to be... But aren't they going to bloat and be different? And th there must be some difference. I, I, I don't, the, I the don't same, think they have pressure chambers at the top. I have the same thoughts. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Just um, looking at the pictures, the trolls are just cages. There are no pressure chambers. Uh, I don't see That's a pressure chamber on any of those pictures. So I don't really see how they could maintain the pressure for those creatures. And yes, I'm totally there with you. Um, if the pressure changes, the form... Um, is very likely to change as well, but that will be even very though they have cameras, so they so they do have visuals of the creatures in their own habitat. Yes, so, so they deploy two two camera systems down there as well to get an idea of what they're actually trawling for. We but should talk to a biologist about this because sh that we should. Seems, yeah. th that that seems to be that this is my first thought: is how 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 valid is the research if you bring them up from a very different pressure? We should revisit the topic with Mario together and just get yep. an idea how that looks like. And um, let me reach out to the BAS and just uh, figure out if someone's available I'd there. I'd love to have a guest chat. on here. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it was an amazing uh, opportunity. So that's really great. And uh, we put into the show notes also the Twitter handles um, of Hugh and uh, James. So just feel free to follow them. It's a great source of uh, inspiration. Um, Hugh is posting very, very actively also from the sh from the ship, which is really nice, but also when he's in the lab. So it's a, a great chapter to follow. I'm, I'm so happy that we have the ability today to get unfiltered direct access to people like them um, and, and pretty much are allowed to look over their shoulder as opposed to having to wait for some instance to filter things and Absolutely. rewrite them and, and package them up. I love that more raw access to information. There, there is really, there, there's a lot of discussion going on on, on Twitter about uh, the quality of the platform and how that has changed and so on and so forth. For me, Twitter... Twitter's main purpose is having the direct access to the science community and mm. just being able to also uh, reach scientists um, on a on a short dial, if you like, just message, message them on, on Twitter and figure out uh, if they're open for further communication. And that's really quite something being up to that, date there. That might be our first approach to get someone like these guys here on yeah, the show. Absolutely. So, yeah. All right. Second topic on the on the news reel here is about an a new interactive tool. Yeah, I'm, I'm all up for tools, and particularly after working on an icebreaker myself, where um, sea eyes really is my, you know, my big passion. Um, you try to facilitate all the tools available on the market to get a better idea of the area region where you're going into. And the um, Australian Antarctic Division, they just compiled a lot of data and developed a tool to actually access the, uh, that data. And what they did is they came up with a map. Um, they called it Nihilus, and Nihilus is one of the very early development stages of sea ice. Um, and Nihilus compiles um, data that goes back 40 years of different um, data sources. We have um, salinity, we have uh, temperature, sea surface temperature, we have um, content of phytoplankton in the area so you can actually get quite a lot of data out of that almost real time it goes almost up to date today um, which is really amazing to see what the sea ice extent looks like what the, the thickness of the ice uh, might look like 
um, to see the development, in particular in, in, in recent days where we have um, a very dramatic development. We, we are in the season with the lowest sea ice extent during summer um, of all time in recorded history, which also projects into the next winter, that the winter uh, sea ice extent will very likely be also a very um, low extent. But this tool gives you a better um, ability to visualize that. But also, when you are on a ship, when you are um, really live in action, this is a planning tool. It really gives you access to um, information you barely find anywhere else. And you can compare it with historical data. So you also can extrapolate ideas of how it could look like, even though... Um, you have some some data in certain areas which are really up to date. I love how you how you have all these different layers that you can enable, disable, and then you can uh, the, change the opacity. So you have multiple things at the same time, and how they relate to what's currently going on and the historic uh, the historic part of that. This is an amazing tool. This and is a great it, tool. It's for for different target. Oh, groups. and of course, it's a historic yes. tool as well. So you can yes. go back to exactly. I don't know. Let's let's go back to 2018 and see how different things were then. Oh, look, very different. <laughs> that looks like winter. Different. That looks like winter extent. That's yeah. winter, and now we now we're going back to 2023 to um, to today and. Bam. That's summer. Yeah, that's the summer extent. Yeah, yeah, you can you can see the the, the big difference. I mean, the sea ice um, development in Antarctica is the biggest seasonal event on the planet. Where you just have the 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 fact that the aerial uh, the, the the area the, the surface area of Antarctica is just doubling every winter just by the sea ice growing. Um, this is something very very nice to visualize. But the this tool also targets different. Um, different audiences. It's good for navigational purpose, for, for ship crews, for bridge crews to actually get an idea how a seance looks like. For scientists, you have such an abundance of data in there dating back 40 years or up to 40 years. That's just really a big funders of, uh, of resource. And it gives you a, an easier access to, to that data so you don't have to go all the way down there um, to do particular research. That's that's really really great. It's a it's a fantastic opportunity brought by uh, the Australian Antarctic Division. Really really cool. Wonderful. All right. Main topic of the day is about going deep. Yeah. Also ice again, but not sea ice. <laughs> Continental ice, land ice, and I think one of the biggest tools in getting idea of how climate um, used to be on the planet are ice cores. And we talked in previous episodes about ice core drilling projects in the past. And this season has been a very, very active one. So just being on a ship in Antarctica, um, dealing with tourists, it's pretty awesome that we have this access to Twitter, to um, direct access to, to scientists. So we actually can build that in. And I did that in my presentations, just talking about um, ongoing ice core projects. And Right now, there are three big projects. There are more, but three main projects I want to focus on today, um, which are competing about um, a superlative of the oldest ice core, um, trying to drill a continuous ice core for the oldest ice. So it's it's like archaeology on land. When you the deeper you dig, the the older things get, and the same is true, of course, in, yeah, in land ice, right? But or yeah, basically, in general, basically, ice or glacier ice forms with overlying layers of snow being compressed. Um, obviously, you have uh, movement in a, in a glacier as well, so you have it also in the ice sheet, uh, and that makes it a little bit tricky because you have upwelling on certain areas, you have mix uh, mixes of layers, and so, so on and so forth. So it's tougher than land archaeology because that typically stays in place and uh, the ice moves or flows around. Yes and no. Land archaeology also is difficult depending on how far you want to date back because um, the crust there is crust is also in motion. So you also have um, crust dissolving on. Okay, I was I was more on the like uh, the, the Romans level and not quite the Earth's history level. <laughs> exactly, but now we are talking about ice cores that are dating back um, over a million years. And holy cow, really. And, and in, if we talk in geological um, data or timescales, then also archaeology, uh, land-based archaeology, would face difficulties because the, um, the, the 
yeah, the bedrock also changes um, over one million years, obviously. But here, um, yeah, brought to us by Scientific American, um, by ABC, by Polar Journal. We want to talk a little bit about those three different projects. And one that's really interesting, which just blew my mind a few years back, is Coldex from the um, US National Science Foundation. And Coldex has one sub-project, um, which is drilling in the Allen Hills. Allen Hills is very close to McMurdo. It's uh, at, the Ross, at the edge of the Ross um, ice shelf in the Transantarctic Mountains. And Allen Hills is or has um, the reputation for drilling um, or having retrieved the oldest ice in Antarctica of all times, 2.5 million years old. That is amazing. It was absolutely amazing when I heard that the first time. The downside is the 2.5 million years is not continuous, so it's a snapshot of the climate 2.5 million years back. So ice cores are a a climate proxy because when snow falls down and is compressed uh, into fern and into ice later on, it traps the atmospheric gases um, compiled in in the air in the ice. And that is what we actually are looking at in an ice core. We try to get the picture of how the atmosphere was consistent at the time of formation. And through um, certain elements, trace elements in the atmosphere, we can actually date how old it is. Um, there are other components as well. So Alan Hills managed to get 2.5 million year old ice. And now the ambition is to fill the blanks between the oldest continuous ice core and the 2.5 million year old ice. The difficulty with Allen Hills is Allen Hills is a so-called blue ice area. So we have a very shallow drilling site. The ice core drill is not um, vertically into the ground as it usually would be but horizontal towards the mountain because the mountain works a little bit as the upwelling area so the ice is constantly in motion and the oldest ice which normally would be at the very very bottom is just um, upwell on the mountain um, mountain slope if you like and brought to the surface that's also one of the reasons why meteorites um, which are coming down to Antarctica are very well found around the Transantarctic Mountains because you have this upwelling there of the ice. And so then up, upwelling, how, how, how do I have to imagine that? Why is it upwelling? Is, is there pressure coming from the side that pushes it up? Like like mountains, some of the mountains are built when, when like just, uh, tectonic plates meet and that kind of stuff? Uh, no, imagine that more like waves, waves running onto the beach. Okay, so we are back to ice being basically like a Viscous. liquid. It flows. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a viscous matter, so it moves. Okay. And in, in that regard, it also moves uphill the mountain if the pressure is enough. And then we suddenly have very, very old ice exposed very close to the surface. And that was the... Um, it wasn't luck. It was actually uh, identified as a site where the, the likelihood is very, very high to get this old ice. And now um, the scientists are going back to actually try to find the... Yeah, or fill the, the, the blanks in between. So- so how okay so <laughs> i have so many questions so it's so an amazing project <laughs> there's 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 stuff caught or trapped in the ice like atmosphere and uh of course organisms and things frozen so um it, do i have to okay so so finding out how old it is um is that do, do they do this by dating some of the carbon in there? Do they do this by comparing the different layers of atmosphere with existing stuff and seeing how it matches? Like like sometimes it's done with a tree ring uh, matching and that kind of stuff. Is that, there, are, there are different... How? how, how? <laughs> there are different um, possibilities to do so and they are all done to just double check and triple check and get a confirmation on the approximate uh, age of the ice or on the atmospheric gases in there. Um, tree rings is something that comes very close to what they actually do as a very first visual confirmation. When they um, retrieve an ice core, it's like a, a cylinder of ice which will be laid down in front of you, and you can see different uh, sections, um, yeah, different uh, types of ice where you actually can see rings in there. And that gives you an idea about certain periods, not necessarily years, but periods in the ice 
the so, and, so certain patterns match with uh, certain periods pretty much exactly um, antarctica has um very little participation so the formation of um of new ice follows a different uh, regularity than it would for example in the himalayas um here we have also the possibility to see um, bedrock particles or dust or volcanic ash um, comp um, compiled in the or like deposited in the in, in the ice. We have had a lot of um, active volcanism. We still have it, but we had in the past a couple of explosive eruptions. They will obviously um, just lay down uh, deposits on the ice, which will be trapped in the ice cores. So, like vol volcanic ash and these kind of things. Exactly. Um, okay. And then, obviously, the elements trapped in the ice itself, they give us a chance as well to analyze them and uh, date the age of, um, yeah, of, of the carbon particles, of nitrogen particles, and so on. I see. So, this is somewhere in the middle of nowhere, I guess. That's actually not in the middle of nowhere. That's pretty close to the, uh, to the edge of Antarctica. That's actually at the Transantarctic Mountains, close to McMurdo Station. But we have two more projects, uh, which one is an Australian project, uh, also by the Australian Antarctic Division. Um, and that is called uh, Million Year Ice Core, MYIC. And then we have very close to the same drilling site, a um, uh, European project called Beyond Apica, which builds up on... Uh, history of drillings um, from the Apica, the European program for ice core uh, drillings in Antarctica. Um, pretty, pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, on the YouTube channel we have right now in the video feed the um, the bedrock underlying on the um, the ice, and we can a see a relief of the bedrock under under like three kilometers of ice. Exactly, and we see wow. the two drilling sites um, like five kilometers apart from each other. So there are considerations in both programs that the drilling site gives the opportunity to um, drill very, very deep and get very, very old ice um, from, the, from the bottom there. And here right now, this year was very, very successful for the Europeans. They drilled down to 850 meters, I think, they managed in that season. Um, they continue next season. The Australians just started to set up camp and just get some very shallow drills to um, to start their research with. The Australians also have a little bit more complicated logistics. The Europeans have a research station 30 kilometers close by, which is called Concordia. Concordia is run by the French and Italian uh, program in East Antarctica. And the Australians try to do the logistics from Casey Station, which is on the coast of East Antarctica. That means they need to traverse from Casey Station all the way to the drilling site, which is 1,200 kilometers away from the coast. So logistics in Antarctica, <laughs> they face obviously uh, certain challenges. One is the distance the other is the weather we have there, the wind wind speeds coming down. And it's pretty, pretty amazing to um, get an idea of um, temperature, wind from people who are um, involved in that project. And uh, I'm going to put a link in the show notes from uh, ABC uh, Australia, which has a, a phone call with the technical director of the logistics of that project, who talks a little bit about um, how they... Uh, face the temperatures when they started um, almost at freezing point zero uh, minus one degree celsius and then once they uh, reached the drilling site they had minus 30 minus 35 and then when the uh, temperatures plummeted down to minus 40 and beyond they realized it's the end of the season um, it's time to go home and then they started traveling back 1.1200 uh, kilometers <laughs> so wild <laughs> This is so wild. It's even wilder when you see those humongous tractors and caterpillars they're yeah. they're using to traverse that down, and you realize they're traveling with ten kilometers per hour speed, one thousand two hundred kilometers. It's a slightly so different way of traveling than we would do on a German that's, highway. That's why you need a vehicle with like autopilot built in. It just <laughs> takes care of everything, so you can I don't know surf the web <laughs> while driving very slowly. But, oh, you, man. but you also really want to have the, the human factor involved there because the surface sure. of Antarctica is not a highway. Um, so you have still <laughs> crevasses, Sturgey, and uh, different features there, which you need to uh, to navigate uh, along. 
Um, but it's interesting to see how long it took. And uh, and one of the Twitter links, there is a beautiful map of the Traverse where they have the daily stops um, piled, piled up on that uh, on that route, which is really amazing to see. It eventually um, took them 42 days back and forth <laughs> just the traversing. That is crazy. And when you think about the, the environment, on a good day, everything is just plain white. On a bad day, you don't see anything, not even the, the tractor in front of you. How just, how do we okay so so they have GPS they they know where they are they have all the modern amenities they have nicely heated cabins I guess but how do you keep yourself from going completely bonkers doing that I suppose podcast listening helps so you load up on uh, yeah. you might you might have a Starlink on the on the top to to download stuff and be in in touch. But yeah, I heard from hey. a couple of, of, of scientists this season that uh, Starlink this year helped a lot uh, of, of getting people or keeping people sane and getting people access. And it's uh, not just it's not just like uh, two vehicles. That's uh, an entire trek. Of, it's it's a, it's a caravan. Yeah, yeah. There was like yeah. um, I think it was five or six big tractors, uh, a piston bully, one of those um, yeah, snow machines. They had each of those tractors had one or two um carriers behind them so that was it, it was a big effort um one of the trackers was pulling their uh, living quarters where they would sleep overnight then so would 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 they would those be the scientists hauling that stuff there or would that be people and then the scientists would fly in later when everything is there and set up that's an interesting question. I think um, it's a mix of both. We have had uh, we had a press agent there, or not a press agent, a uh, photographer, mm -hmm. which delivered uh, an awesome documentation um, on the Twitter channel of the uh, Antarctic Australian Antarctic Division. Um, we had a couple of logistics there, but also um, scientists. But they also had the chance, and that was then the the big um, advantage that they had a, a Basler airplane which was flying from the drilling site to Casey to actually get the ice cores out. So I suppose that some of the scientists would also um, go through the plane. I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Well, 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 that's 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 fairly fairly amazing. It's a real wild, a really wild um, adventure to to do stuff like that. It's really amazing to get uh, the chance to drill so deep and get a consistent picture of how climate has developed over hundred thousands uh, millions of years so the the goal right now is to go back a million years and and more the longest continuous ice core we have right now dates back eight hundred thousand years so now the nothing <laughs> the aim is to go two hundred thousand uh, years further and possibly possibly even further but so it uh, costs so, a lot of money it so takes a lot of time where are they in the project right now? Is the drilling finished? Are they now evaluating the cores? So the the whole drilling project is a multi-year project. The longest ice core has been drilled for 11 years. So they just started last year. So this season is the second season for the Europeans and it's the first for the for the Australians. The, the Australians had some very shallow dry, uh, drills this year. The Europeans went down to 800 meters of 3.5 kilometers of ice so it gives you an idea it will take a while the problem here is to maintain the integrity of the ice core but also of the drill hat itself the drilling speed is about 0.2 millimeters per second which is about 12 millimeters per minute it's That's just not bad it's it's very slow if you yeah, want to drill 3.5 kilometers but at least I guess you don't have to cool the the drill head because that's taken care of. You you rather he, uh, have to avoid it freezing. Yes, <laughs> it's a, that was one of the big challenges on the Vostok core actually uh, when they drilled down there. Oh, the is. and then of course if you if you if you if you heat it up, that might be done with water, I guess. So you have the you have the danger of contamination and. It's not water, it's actually worse, it's chemicals, and that's then actually a contaminating problem. And you remember we talked about Vostok uh, or Lake Vostok in one of the uh, earlier episodes and the problem of contamination of the subglacial lake, which has been isolated for three million years and more, and then you have the contaminants going in uh, from the drilling. Yeah, that, there, there are a couple of question marks there, but 
Also, the drilling process itself, the technological aspect behind that, um, is developing very, very much. And um, yeah, I would love to look further into how they avoid the, the, the hat to freeze over. But at the same time, they also they drill a certain depth, take out the drill hat and the ice core, and continue deploying the drill hat um, to continue drilling, basically. Yeah. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's a lot of segments coming together. Right now, the um, Australian segments are on their way to, to Hobart, where uh, the, the headquarters of the Australian and Arctic Division is. The uh, European project is going to Italy right now, where the ice cores will be um, yeah, investigated. So I'm really curious what the first findings will be, but also curious how that project develops over the years. Hmm. All right. Race to the oldest ice. Amazing stuff. Absolutely. Thanks for thanks for putting this together. This is this is very cool. So, we know everything about ice now, about the life uh, at the very depths of the Southern Ocean, um, new mapping tools, and old old ice. So, that brings us to the end of this episode of Curiously Cola. Thanks everyone for being Curiously Cola, Curiously Polar. <laughs> Thanks everyone for being subscribed. If you're not, check out your podcast app of choice and uh, you'll find us there and hit that subscribe button. That helps us make us more visible. Um, you'll find more at CuriouslyPolar.com and uh, yeah, by being subscribed, you'll find out when there's new episodes. See you soon. See Take you care. Soon. Bye bye. <laughs>